Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Bath Masters Experience here at the School of Management, the University of Bath. I'm delighted you're able to join us. Um, whether you've applied or you're thinking of applying to Bath, uh, the aim of this, uh, this uh, very special session, live session, is to give you some insights uh, that you might need to decide if Bath is the right choice for you. Um, so uh, the agenda for today, an uh, exciting agenda we have in, in, in line for you, is uh, following my brief welcome and introduction to the session, uh, we have a taster's lecture um, delivered by our very own Dr. Vigelis Gianakis, and he's going to be talking about the uh, strategies in times of turbulence and where next. So without further ado, um, the university is um, this year's uh, Sunday Time, Times and Sunday Times Good University Guide uh, University of the Year, which was something we're really proud of uh, at the university. We, we've worked very hard to maintain um, strong student experience throughout times of uh, quite difficult times in, recent, in the recent 12, 18 months or so. And we're delighted to say that we've been given this title this year by this very reputable uh, rankings and it, the accolade really reflects uh, a really strong performance around student experience and but also our excellent graduate employability which is something we take and um, uh, take great pride in um now as you know rankings uh, they sit at uh, the very top level institutional level and you know all the rankings really are coming in all sorts of shapes and form but but critically speaking you know we we, we are ranked very highly at all levels including, of course, uh, not just at the subject level, but at the programme level. So in the QS um, World University Rankings Top 50, uh, our MSc Marketing is ranked uh, within that group and globally and is in the top 10 UK um, ranking as well. Um, moving on to the top 100 in QS World Rankings and Business Masters, the MSc Management is ranked in that top 100 group globally and is also top 10 in the UK. Um, added to that, we have our MSc Finance, which is ranked also in the top 100 globally and in the top 20 in the UK. And finally, just to, to mention one of our top programmes, Business Analytics is ranked in the top 100 globally and top 10 in the UK. So you come into a, a very strong school. Um, and besides which, you know, it, it, we, we're an ambitious school and this is reflected very much in the, uh, the programmes that we offer. We have a range of both general and specialist degrees. I should start off really with a general management degree, and this is something that's become uh, very popular for us. We, we have what we call a conversion management degree. The, the MSc management is open to students that don't have uh, a management background, that trains them and brings them into the management field. Um, and is, it, all our programs are year long. Um, and in the general management sense, the MSc management has become very popular. It also has pathways within it. You can specialize in marketing, operations, and finance. Um, talking about finance, we have a finance related set of degrees, our finance suite, um, including accounting finance, finance, of course, and with the specialisms in banking and risk management. The specialist degrees vary uh, quite, quite widely uh, across a range of subjects, um, starting with business analytics at the top there, you can see on the list. And going through this list, you can see there that the focus is very much around some of the core issues in today's modern uh, management and entrepreneurship, HRM, uh, international management, of course, marketing, operations, strategic retail, which I'll come back to shortly, and sustainability and management. Now, interestingly, on that list, you'll also see engineering business management and innovation technology management. Those are two programs that are taught jointly with our top engineering school, also in the university. So um, some degrees there, if you think about from a specialist and generalist point of view, we also have some online degrees, just to mention those. Uh, they reflect very much the on-campus programmes, but they're delivered online. Um, if you want to go to the Scan Me, uh, the, the QR code on the, on the right-hand side of the screen, it's quite interesting. It'll take you to not just more details about those courses, uh, and also the MSc brochure, um, which again details um, more, more, more precisely what's go, what goes on in each of those programmes. Um, but you also get things like typical year uh, for an MSc student, details about our career support, alumni insights, uh, student experience and wellbeing, um, the city of Bath, of course, which is, which is a very famous and historical city, a very beautiful city, I have to say. It's a UNESCO World Heritage City. Um, and also details about scholarships and rankings. As I mentioned, one of the one of the highlights really for us uh, in the coming year is the launch of a brand new program in strategic retailing. 
Um, and this really is a, is a, it's a top program that's been designed with employers uh, to give people the best possible chance um, to get a job in this field. Um, and the sort of skills that have been taught on this program are exceptional. Um, it's really, it's a program really preparing you for, to become a future leader in retailing. And it will cover a range of subjects like operations and marketing analytics, uh, as well as consumer behavior and human resources. Um, it's, it's open to students with any background, any discipline. Uh, I said, I think it's going to be one of our top programs going into the future. So look out for this. And if it interests you, then get more information uh, either through the brochure or on the website. So um, I think what might be worth spending a bit of time on is just to talk briefly about um, some of the key features, uh, which span our range of master's degrees. Um, you can see there that we are full time, which means that all our master's degrees are full time in the last 12 months, starting in September. Um, this doesn't apply to online masters, but as you imagine, a year a year long, long degree is fairly intense. Uh, we fit a lot into the areas you're about to find out, including a lot of support around professional development and careers. But also, there's a lot in those degrees now, and I think, you know, in, one, in terms of the sort of skills that that you'll find uh, you'll develop over the year, time management is definitely one of them. Um, we are a research intensive university I'm very proud of our research records um, and our faculty are experts in their field and those are the people you'll meet in the classroom they bring their latest research thinking into the classroom and give it a real cutting edge you want the latest thinking if you're going to come and do a top degree at a top university in the uk you want to know that you're getting the very latest thinking and research as part of your learning and that's what we do uh, in the school of management um, the career support which you're going to hear more about uh, very shortly, is included uh, in the timetable for all our MSc courses. Um, it's a full support service. Uh, your students uh, doing an MSc with us will have access to a dedicated careers advisor, which is very important because people follow careers in a very bespoke way, a very individual way, and it's important that you get the advice that you really need. So, um, as I said, you'll learn more about the career support and the range of activities which support your business uh, and, and practice-based learning particularly. Um, alongside that is um, a desire to make sure that you, that you leave the university as the most, in the most professionally developed way possible. And this will give you the best chance of getting the job that you really want. The professional development program runs throughout the year, starts in week one. And there's a series of optional activities for you to take part in. You work with employers, you develop the sort of skills that they're really looking for. Um, because of our reputation for working with corporates and companies and organizations, um, we talk to them and they talk to us and, and we consult with them in terms of what we're, what we're developing, not just through uh, our courses, but also through this, this exceptional professional development program. Again, you'll learn more a little bit, sorry, you'll learn a little bit more about that uh, a bit later. Um, we also have dedicated student experience officers. Uh, your well-being is incredibly important to us, as proven by the fact that, you know, we were um, university Day this year, partly due to the fact that we have such a strong record for, for excellent student experience. And that all comes down to the support that you get through your student experience officers. And they are there to support MSc students and they're devoted to that process um, and they will support you throughout your degree. And, and so finally, um, you know, you, you, you need to know that you're coming to a, a diverse community. Cross-cultural learning is a very important part of what we offer on our courses. Uh, and at Bath, you'll be part of a vibrant international community. Very proud to say that our master's students come from more than 50 different countries. Um, in fact, at the moment, I'm sitting talking to you from Taipei in Taiwan, uh, where I'm meeting lots of amazing Taiwanese students, I have to say. So if you're on there from Taiwan, hello. Uh, I'm Taiwan time at the time at the moment. So um, this is all part and parcel of, of, of how we build uh, diversity into our programs. We're, you know, our, our reach uh, is, is global. Uh, our interest is global. And um, so you can look forward to a, 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 a truly cross-cultural experience when you come to Bath. Um, it's now my my great pleasure uh, to welcome um, my, my friend and colleague, Vigelis, Dr. Vigelis Giannakis. And I think he's going to talk to you a little bit about developing strategies in the times of turbulence. Um, I should say, um, uh, Vigelis, welcome. And he's an associate professor, professor in in operations and supply chain management. He's also director of one of our top research centers in smart warehousing and logistical systems. And um, works very closely with the um, 
the design the uh, and the engineering design department has developed a bespoke case study um, that is uses on strategic market management and I think he's going to share that with you today so uh, Vigalis it's over to you um, enjoy your session um, with Vigalis and uh, see you in Bath very soon I hope Vigalis over to you thank you thank you Pete good morning uh, good afternoon good evening uh, everybody uh, I'm Vigalis. I'm, I'm calling you from my office in Bath, uh, overlooking the, the, the beautiful uh, parade we have um, in, 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 in our new building, which is very exciting, uh, not just for us, but I'm pretty confident for, for you uh, uh, joining us uh, later this year. As uh, Pete said, I am an associate professor here and specializing in operations and supply chain management. And what I wanted to do today is rather than have a, a 30 minute long one way presentation, I want to give you a sneak peek into the kind of innovative teaching we are up to uh, at the university. And, and I'm gonna do that by uh, sharing with you one of those things we have developed ourselves from scratch with the support of, of industry and some, um, some experts uh, uh, out there where we took uh, a case study, and we turned that into something, something new, something innovative, and something I'm pretty confident you're going to enjoy uh, as well. So um, we normally run this case study in a, in a longer session, not just in, in 30 minutes. So today, it's not so much about covering everything around strategy and, and figuring out how to uh, make companies great uh, in, in the future. It's more about uh, together, working on something um, uh, in the form of a case study and giving you the feeling of how it might be like when you join us uh, in, in September. Uh, so with that, do feel free to use the Q&A while I'm speaking. Um, ideally, I want to make this as interactive as, as possible and, um, and do enjoy the next uh, 30 minutes or so. So let me start by sharing a couple of very uh, basic slides just to get the ball uh, rolling for, for all of us. So today's agenda, today's main goal is to rather discuss, rather than discussing generally about strategy and what it means for companies and organizations out there, I want you for the next 30 minutes to put yourselves in the shoes of Sarah. Who is Sarah, you might ask. I'm going to introduce her to you in just a minute. As I said before, uh, what you're going to see, and you are one of the very first people who see that uh, case study in action, is what we call a cinematic case study, where we go from the traditional paper-based stories that quite often you see in, in case studies in business schools to something very interactive, uh, quite innovative uh, that will give you the same information but in a very different format, much more interactive and 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 uh, and an and interesting format. So again, uh, forget about your name for the next twenty minutes. Let's become Sarah with me uh, for the next uh, uh, twenty minutes or so. You're now Sarah, and Sarah, uh, you know, you can imagine yourself being Sarah. Uh, but let's now imagine here being the lady on the left-hand side. Uh, you have uh, graduated the University of Bath. You have built a long-standing career managing companies. And now you are appointed as a CEO for the first time. And you're appointed as a CEO in a company called Food Solutions, a company that is specializing in, in, in packaging, um, as you will see in a minute, and it's, a, it's one of those companies we quite often refer to as an engineering and technology company, a company that is developing new products, but also new services for their clients. So Sarah has been appointed as the new CEO. And before she goes to her job for the first time, she's trying to find out as much as possible about the company. So let's watch with me a short video explaining what Food Solution really is and where they are today.
So here is Food Solutions, uh, a, a company with more than 30 years experience in a sector that became, uh, became big in the, in the 80s, simply because uh, companies started not just producing, but also wanting to distribute their food all over the world. So here we have a company that 30 years ago created a very innovative bespoke product that changed the industry because it allowed producers of food, vegetables, and other types of, of food items to distribute them around the world. So that's great, isn't it? Um, and then Sarah also looked at Food Solutions website to see a little bit more about what is going on there. Um, as you can see from the website here, Food Solutions is really proud of their people. Uh, they really believe, or that's what they say on, on their website, uh, into the value of their people, their employees, but also their customers. And they also have designed a very, uh, a very nice uh, strategic plan that they have shared with, uh, with their customers, speaking about their vision to help uh, people uh, distribute nutritious and fresh food around the world, uh, regardless of uh, where it is grown. They have also their own uh, longer uh, mi uh, mission about what they want to do as a business, trying to support uh, fresh fruit and vegetable producers around the world, but also be a technology leader, providing not just the packaging material, but also equipment uh, when this, this uh, required. And then they have also have their own values, uh, focusing on innovation and technology, and that seems to be key for them. They want to be the best. They want to think and act globally. This is all what the brand is about. Have a long-term mindset, but also be as close as possible to their customers. So do keep that in mind, that vision, mission, and values uh, triplet when we consider uh, where Food Solutions is today. The other thing Sarah did is she Googled the company, went around to see uh, what, uh, what uh, media outlets uh, talk about. And, and she found this very nice website talking about how Food Solutions managed to establish a legacy and, and how uh, Food Solutions uh, developed this legacy based on three main aspects. It's technology uh, that was quite uh, often protected from very successful patents. Uh, there are customer relationships that were great and long-standing across 23 countries around the world and, and how important they were for the company. But also from a manufacturing perspective, the fact that over the years, they managed to, uh, to develop a large a very, and very efficient manufacturing base to help them grow uh, rapidly. So with all that, Thara showed up for the first day at your new job, uh, knowing that the, the, the expectations were quite high. And why is that? Because um, a company that have had 25 years of remarkable growth is now facing a downturn in sales performance. So the owner of the company and the chairman of the company and the different stakeholders have started worrying. And that's where Sarah comes in to see if she can uh, save the day. And we might not get to the part where Sarah is gonna or not going to save food solutions, but let's at least look into what is going on and what might be the main issues food solutions is facing. So the main thing I want you to think about is whether what you will see is, in your opinion, a temporary blip or part of a bigger issue. Uh, is food solutions in trouble um, or they need to just make small changes or maybe it's just a matter of luck uh, um, that the, uh, uh, the, uh, defined where they are right now. So let's start saying what others think about food solutions. And first of all, let's see what the, uh, the chairman of food solutions have to say to Sarah when she joins the company. Welcome to the company. It's such a pleasure to have you on board. 
we're expecting great things from you as the new CEO of Food Solutions. We have seen 25 years of fantastic growth. However, I am most concerned about the recent downturn in sales. I'm unclear myself if this is a temporary blip or part of a bigger issue. This is your first assignment as CEO. I'd like you to report back to me in three months with your analysis and assessment of what's going on and your recommendations on how to address this. I strongly recommend that you reach out to your management team members and some of our customers to get their views on the situation. Good luck. So here we are in a very realistic setting. You have a company you have to manage. You have your chairman coming to you saying, welcome to the company, but you have a big task in front of you. And you now have three months to understand what is actually going on. The chairman pointed towards not just understanding what the problem is, but also making recommendations to the board about uh, shifting the ship. But he also recommended that you go about, that you go around talking to your customers, but also to your, your main team. So let's see what they have to say. Um, so first of all, uh, as it's quite often the case, there are data available. And I'm not gonna share every little Excel file we provide to you along with this case study, but you can very easily see something I, I talked to you about before. So not just the, the, the installed base have reached the plateau, so food solutions is not growing anymore in terms of how many products they install, how many products their customers use, but you can now also see how the consumables are going down. So their customers start using uh, less and less um, packaging material. That's what the consumables uh, refer to here. And if you look at the right hand side of this graph, you will see that since 2015, um, there is also a, a downturn in, in, uh, in revenue, uh, which after uh, 20, 25 years of rapid growth, taking the company from zero million all the way up to about 700 million revenue per year, uh, we now see a potential problem. So food solutions, Sarah moves on trying to understand what those products and services are, they do three things. They have a consumables line, uh, which is 70% of the revenue. So they rely quite heavily on that one. And it's primarily about packaging. It's primarily about types of fill that this company produces and sells that uh, refers to what we put around food and vegetables to keep them, uh, keep them um, uh, safe. So 70% of the revenue comes from that. There is also an equipment line just 50% of the revenue, but uh, Food Solutions realized that not only can they sell the packaging material, the fill, but they can also sell the machines that use that fill to package goods. So a few years back, they designed their own equipment line and they now have more than 4,000 installations worldwide. Again, just 50% of the revenue. And then there is a new, uh, a new and third um, part of the product offering, also worth just a sixth of the revenue, which is around maintaining, repairing, and helping with the operations of those machines. So you, they went from the film, which was the main innovation, to the machines that are using the film, but also now servitizing a physical good, servitizing a physical product, and selling services that help people maintain those machines, install them, repair them, make, make the most out of them, et cetera. Moving on, competition is, is quite firm. Um, you will see that um, when Food Solutions started, the competition was quite limited. Uh, but nowadays, uh, there are uh, way more uh, um, people around. There is OptiFoods, uh, one of the, uh, the first uh, competitors uh, many years ago that uh, li licensed uh, food solution um, um, uh, products, uh, and they, they still take just, just a, part, a niche of the overall market. But then in the 90s, 
a new alternative technology uh, was invented uh, by Flexifoods, a company based in Germany that became really aggressive in the mid 90s. And it's now one of the main competitors to what uh, Flex uh, Food Solutions is, is offering. In 2007, uh, the main patent Food Solution has expired and that allowed new competitors to join the market and to replicate the film that the Food Solutions is, is producing. So companies like Econopack from China emerged by um, uh, copying the expired patents that Food Solutions had and providing cheaper options to their customers. And more recently, with this whole movement towards more sustainable solutions, we have companies like Econopack that are emerging. Uh, this, this one, for example, in a country like Switzerland, that is trying to get to fill that gap in the market that says sustainability is important and we need to move away from plastic, we need to find recyclable, recyclable material, and so on and so forth. So here's the situation of the competition as it is being seen by Sarah through some market uh, competition market research. Let's now move on and speak to some of, of your team members. And in this, try to understand the different perspectives different stakeholders have, and also try to understand not just the problem Sarah might have to face, but also how people think differently even if they are a member of the same team. So let's speak to the team. So uh, Sarah is managing a bunch of people from uh, chief technology officers to CFOs, human resources, and so on and so forth. Let's start with Marcus, the CTO, and see what he has to say. Sarah is going to give him a ring. Hi, Marcus. Good to talk. I'm looking forward to visiting you at our R&D centre soon. I'm doing a bit of initial fact finding about FS and I wanted to get your perspective on the challenges and opportunities that the company are facing. Good to hear from you, Sarah, and I look forward to hosting you here at the R&D Centre. I'm sure you'll be impressed with some of the projects that we have ongoing, and I'm hopeful that you will see the opportunity to invest more in research and development so that we can regain technology leadership. Tell me more. I thought we were the market leader. Well, we certainly used to be, and now our patents have expired, it has allowed our competitors to copy us. One of them, Sustainopack, has had a breakthrough with a new material, which is a real concern. We really need to up our investments in R&D to develop a new breakthrough technology to recapture our uniqueness. That is clear, Marcus. And it is certainly disappointing that Sustainopack got there before us with this new material. I look forward to visiting you soon and understanding what ideas you have for the new products and technologies. Absolutely. As soon as you get the chance, please visit us. So Marcus speaks about the competition, but also the fact that uh, food solutions have lost this first position as the market leader. Uh, new technologies come through and they are staying behind. And Marcus, it's all about, I need more money to invest more to get uh, the, new, the new next thing from our labs. Let's look at the issue from the finance perspective. What does a CFO have to say? And here is an email from, from him. So Sarah emailed him a few days ago and John came back to say, um, well, all those are good ideas, but we have not seen sufficient investments in the long term uh, for the company. So there is an issue there around funding availability. Uh, as any, so any CFO, they want to see cash flows being healthy. They want to see cash reserves being there to support the company. Uh, and he's always considered, considering whether the necessary funds are available. So already you see some sort of potential tension between the R&D people and the funding people, the R&D department and the finance officer. Let's move on and see what we have to say about our people. Uh, so Sarah, you know, uh, being a, 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 a millennial, maybe, that landed your first CEO job, uh, can also have a chat with your human resources VP 
Uh, and as you, you will be able to see in a minute through this discussion, um, the, the human resources uh, VP Tolani um, believes that uh, the people are great, uh, what they are doing is great. They have been doing it very successfully for the last 25 years. And she doesn't think what, what we see is a big issue, probably a temporary small downturn because the people are there and they are great. Uh, she's also advising Sarah against making any big moves that might jeopardize what is going on. Um, but she really believes into the people the company have and what they can offer. However, um, the, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, it, there seems to be a gap between what the employees know um, and, and, and maybe a gap between them understanding the vision and the goals of the company and, um, and then acting on it in the benefit for the benefit of the company. So HR thinks maybe it's okay, not a big thing. We can rely on our people. Uh, let's not make any sudden moves. So here it is, R&D, finance, HR. Let's now move into the products and let's see what the equipment VP has to say. Sarah, I'm pleased to meet you to talk about our challenges and opportunities in the equipment business. That's great to hear. I'm interested to hear your views and what we need to do to get back to growth. The importance of the equipment business is underrated in the company. I realize consumables generate most of the income, but if we don't sell the equipment, we can't get income on consumables. The truth is we've fallen behind on some of the areas of our equipment portfolio. We need to invest more in our product development and our equipment sales teams. Then we'll dominate the market once again. That's interesting to hear. Thanks, Petra. So Petra, representing uh, equipment, wants to see more R&D because she thinks that people buying the equipment will, will essentially buy the consumables as well. So that's going to be a win-win situation. But again, there is a call for more research and development to provide a stronger portfolio uh, in terms of the equipment which, which solutions can sell. Let's look at the other two parts. Uh, remember, uh, Food Solutions does consumables, equipment, and the MRO, the maintenance, repair, and operations. So let's listen, let's hear from uh, Johan, who is the MRO VP. Hi, Sarah. I was just chatting to the MRO director for the German market. His team just secured a new service contract with our biggest customer in Germany, worth over 2 million a year. Anyway, how are you settling in? It's great to get the chance to chat to you about MRO. Yes, I've been looking forward to hearing your view about the MRO business. I see it's not the biggest part of the business, but it seems to be performing well. Absolutely. Our recent growth is mostly coming from MRO. With increased pressure on production costs, we are fantastically placed to offer a range of services. We can move beyond selling customer spare parts and become a true service partner. Interesting. But what is it going to take to grow the business even more? We need to direct more investment into the MRO business. That way, we can expand our MRO portfolio, increase our workforce and generate more profits. We have a lot of unique skills in the industry that others don't have. Our MRO business is valuable, rare and difficult to copy. I could even see the opportunity to not only service our own equipment, but competitor equipment too. Our skills and capabilities are far superior to our competitors. It sounds like a really interesting opportunity. Let's talk more. Funny, isn't it? Get another person asking for more money to, to grow his part of the business. So there's a lot of tension already that we see in the case study. But we get some new information from Johan around the fact that uh, production costs is one of the main drivers of some of their clients and, and how MRO services is not just uh, growing, but can help existing customers, but also some of the customers of their, of their competitors and how the MRO business could be food solutions way into the clients of their competitors. In the interest of time, let's listen to what Shabana had to say, the consumables VP, 70% of the overall business in a Skype call with Sarah. Great to meet you, Shabana. I've heard a lot about you. And the same to you, Sarah. It's great to finally have you on board. 
We've had lots of good things about you from our chairman. I am meeting with each of my management team members to hear your opinion about what the challenges are that we're facing and to get your ideas and what we need to do about them. I've met with the chairman and he has highlighted the importance of the consumable business as the key income generator for the company. I've looked at the recent company performance and I'm concerned. What's your take? Consumables is the biggest revenue generator in the company. I believe that we need to aggressively fight against competition across all segments. And I think we should consider an acquisition. We have to be prepared to take our competitors head on. It will potentially mean reducing prices and margins, but this is necessary given the level of competition we are facing. I felt that the previous CEO was reluctant to take the bold steps necessary, but we simply must find a way to compete against the increased environmentally friendly materials offered by Sustainopack. Thank you, Shabana, for your input. I'm going to meet with the other management team members to hear their view, but I'll certainly consider what you said. So Shabana is a big, uh, it's, a, it's a big believer into let's do more of what we do well. We have 70% of the business relying on consumables. We need to become even stronger there. And buying one of our competitors might be the way forward. Now, if we had more time in class, I would also give you more data. Uh, we also have some more financial data you can look at. You could talk to Kamrul and Alec from supply chain and sales. But in the interest of time for today, based on what you have seen and some input from a customer, Quality Foods, uh, who very clearly say that uh, food solutions have made sufficient progress in many of the areas they care about, reducing costs, improving quality, reducing inventories. It seems like competition has shown greater flexibility on prices and fitting their and meeting their needs. So the, the, the input we also get from some of the clients is quite worrying. So with that, I'm going to pause for a minute and ask you with the information you have available in front of you to consider where we are. Do you reckon food solutions is facing a small blip, not a major issue? Is there a major concern and we need to realign the strategy of the company? Is, it, is the concern so big we need to consider transforming what our company does? Or is it too late to do anything? And we are in the middle of a catastrophe that is threatening the future of food solutions. I'm gonna pause for 10 seconds. Feel free to add your thoughts in the Q&A or just think yourselves. If you were in Sarah's shoes, where do you think we are based on what you have seen already? All right, so as I believe many of you have, have guessed or have, have estimated based on your assessment. I wouldn't say that we are, what Food Solutions is facing is a small issue. It's certainly not a catastrophe. They are still having, making really good numbers in revenue. They are still a big company. They still operate in many countries. But it seems like there might be a need for realigning the strategy of the company or even considering a major transformation, which we don't know yet. So the next thing for Sarah and her team would be to go around using some of very popular, very well accepted strategy management skills, uh, sorry, tools to go to the next level of assessment with the situation of, of food solutions. So one of the main things Sarah could look at is five different things. So for many of you who might have studied management before, those five things might ring a bell. And you might have guessed it right. I'm referring to Porter's Five Forces, a very simple yet powerful tool that looks into the company, its competition, the threat of new entrants and new competition, their suppliers and their buyers. And by by going back to the information I gave you and thinking about it, you will see that there is certainly increasing, um, increasing a threat across the board from new entrants, bargaining of power of buyers, substitutes, 
with new film materials and new competition, uh, but also the bargaining power of suppliers has changed uh, since they now go and serve their competition as well. The next thing Sarah would do, and we, we help you do that in class, and this might ring, this might ring a bell, is apply a, not SWOT, but SWOT analysis. Again, another popular, yet very powerful tool that look into internally the company, the strengths and the weaknesses they have, but also externally and each environment, the opportunities and the threats. And by understanding what we do well and what are the opportunities in the market we operate, but also what we don't do very well and what are the threats from the environment, we can better understand how to move forward from there. Now, the last thing Sarah would do, and I'm going to leave you with that, is consider the future. Remember, the chairman said, I need you to tell me what your recommendations are for the future. So what is the future strategy we should develop to beat the competition and to become, again, the market leader? And there are many options with different difficulty, different, different um, impact, different levels of funding required, and so on and so forth. But the nice way to think about potential strategy options and food solutions has options across the board is with those five things. They, they, we could do something at the business level. We could consider acquisitions or alliances merging with a company. We could consider becoming more and more international. We could consider innovating more within the company or thinking of improvements at the corporate level. And those five big categories can then break further into more specific strategies. So food solutions could decide to go against the competition that is trying to sell cheap material and compete with cost leadership. Or they could try to innovate more and come up with the next big thing in terms of equipment or film. Or simply consider new geographies, new places they have not been uh, performing before. So with that, I'm going to stop my presentation. I hope this gave you a nice feeling about the kind of work we do within the University of Bath. This case study, if you do join us, might be one of the things your unit conveners will, um, will uh, work with you on. But even if they don't, feel free to reach out to me if you want to know more about Sarah and what happened to her in the future. The case study actually has a part two and part three where we look into marketing and HR issues as well. Thank you very much, everybody.